Does the spike protein contribute directly to the formation of clots in our circulation? Not just any clots, abnormal clots that are normally not found in our circulation under normal circumstances. That's going to be the topic of our video today. My name is Dr. Michael Rashik of Mara Genomics and let's get started. So I've been making a series on how spike protein is involved in formation of clots. Today we're finally going to be reviewing the first set of data published by, by authors spearheaded by researchers from South Africa that investigated this and they were able to show that spike protein directly influences the three-dimensional structure of fibrinogen. They use a specific type of technique to show this. And right away, just to get to, to the bottom of this, remember every time our cells get infected by the virus, the S1 subunit of the spike protein gets released, gets released into the circulation. And they were able to show that it is the S1 component of the spike protein that can actually affect the three-dimensional structure of, of, uh, of the fibrin molecule that is involved in formation of clots. Check out our past video that talks about how clots are formed and how fibrin is involved in the formation of clots to, to get background information. And also check out another video on where we describe the spike protein that it's made up of two subunits, the S1 and S2. S1 is the main head and it's that head that interacts with the ACE2 receptor that allows subsequently virus to infect the cell that it targeted via ACE2 receptor, okay? So that's important, important information. So what the authors, are, these authors also showed, remember in, in the previous numerous videos, I showed that they, they were able to use fluorescent microscopy to, to study abnormal clots. But when I say abnormal, what I meant by that is that these clots are amyloid in nature. That in itself means they are, the proteins involved are misfolded. They're not folded properly. So they have abnormal three-dimensional shape. And they were able to show that through the use of this compound called thioflavin T, which interacts with abnormal amyloid proteins. And that's how you can actually study such proteins and they were able to show that these clots seen in long COVID or in acute COVID are amyloid or abnormal in nature. And in this first experiment that I want to tell you about, the authors were able to show that taking normal, healthy blood and exposing it to, to spike increase the level of formation of these abnormal abnormal clots and it didn't take much of a spike protein they were able to use only one nanogram of spike protein per milliliter now that's one order of magnitude higher than what is the typical amount found or about sorry i should say 10 times more uh, higher than what is typically found post-infection. Post-infection or vaccination, we covered this in the past videos, you get to see typically about 100 picograms of spike protein per milliliter of blood. But I've also mentioned in the series dedicated to the science of shedding that higher levels of spike protein have also been observed in the blood, including up to one nanogram of per mil of spike protein. So this is definitely in the potential physiological levels, what they were able to show. And clearly there were, these authors are showing that these levels of spike protein could be on its own, can be inducing formation of these abnormal clots. So definitely very, very important data. On top of that, the same amount of spike protein was used by these authors to show that when they use that amount of that spike protein exposed to blood, such amount of spike protein was also activating platelets. Now, remember in the past videos I mentioned activated platelets also are involved in the formation of clots as well. And activated platelets are also involved in pro-inflammatory state. So not exactly what we want in high amount. This is only should be used in situations when we need and spike protein not only leads to increased activation of platelets, it also leads to 
to clumping of platelets. So also not a necessarily welcome, welcome scenario. So next what the authors did is they showed, and this is something I very much appreciated, they took, took electron microscopy images of clots and uh, check out our past videos for background information. As always, I apologize about the hair. It was raining on me a moment ago. They check out past videos on electron microscopy. Basically, this is as close as we can possibly get on, on getting actual photographs of molecular substances. So that's basically the closest we can possibly take uh, pictures of cells and 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 proteins and etc. So and they were able to show they studied these clots, these abnormal clots. So in this particular image, in this particular publication that we were reviewing today, they they showed the what what the blood from a healthy individual looks like, and and then they compared what the blood from a healthy individual exposed to spike protein would look like. So you can see what what activated platelets post-exposure to spike protein look like. And then they were able to show in other panels how this, that exposure to spike protein leads to the formation of these fibrin networks of what I call wires, basically fibrin molecules. When they start coalescing together, they form like long, like spaghetti noodles, what looks like spaghetti noodles and or like I call it wires. And so they was spontaneously forming and some of these start to look abnormal in nature. So that's the bad news, by the way. But I also have good news in all of this. So that there's a bad news and a good news I wanted to, to share with you from, from the study. So that's the bad news is that mere exposure to spike protein seems to be contributing to the formation of these abnormal clots. And uh, well, then maybe let's get to the good news then, right? So uh, the good news is that they, and this is the next experiment that I'm going to be discussing, is definitely my favorite that they, that they presented in, in, in that particular publication. And that is basically, they studied the clot formations inside tubes and basically they allowed them to measure how clots are formed under flow. So they were flowing blood through these tubes and they put thrombin in so which thrombin starts uh, the generation of clots and and they were able to show what it looks like when you take healthy blood and they were able to see tiny tiny clots that that formed after some time and these clots got easily dislodged as well now they when they took blood from uh, individuals who were uh, sick with uh, acute covid-19 and those clots uh, became quite large. They formed really quick as well, and and you could really see, and you could really see the difference. And and these clots were not dislodged through the blood flow. So big, big difference. Now here's the good news: is that they took also the blood, the blood of healthy individuals, and they exposed them to the spike protein. And again, you can see that clots were being formed as well but um, they were not the same level of size and there's not the same order and they did happen to be dislodged. So this is the good news is that, okay, maybe spike protein can produce clots, sure, right? But, on, but these clots can be dislodged. They're not as, let's call it sticky or maybe as maybe dangerous as what is potentially seen in, in those acute COVID-19 individuals. And Clearly, that would indicate that there has to be other predisposing factors, other molecules involved in, in the formation of clots that, that um, are persistent in, in, in retaining their shape. So what the authors basically are concluding from this paper is that the clots um, that are formed merely due to exposure of the spike protein are somewhere in between what we would see the healthy clots and those that are the worst, which are the ones that are seen in individuals with, with, uh, from, who suffer from acute COVID-19, uh, including also um, the shape. So the clots from acute COVID-19 individuals are quite more dense. They're, they're, they don't 
look the same way so that, that those spaghetti noodles are more compact in, in the formation of the clots. And when you just use the spike protein without any other additional molecules and you just take the healthy plasma, it's going to be somewhere in between. So that's good because perhaps that means that there is a less likelihood of having such clots flowing around in circulation and causing problems because re remember in the previous videos I was mentioning the authors believe that it is precisely these unusual clots, these amyloid abnormal clots formation in post long COVID, in individuals with long COVID or, or individuals with acute COVID-19 that might be leading to the, the, the array of, of persistent symptoms and they believe it might be one of the big reasons why is, of course, is because these clots end up clotting small blood vessels and it means that oxygen is not being delivered to the tissues and you end up with uh, experiencing the variety of the symptoms that people are suffering as a consequence in, in long, long, long COVID. And uh, that's, that's it for today. That's the first paper I wanted to, to discuss that shows how spike protein can directly be involved in the formation of these clots as well as the first evidence showing how spike protein could be directly involved in interaction with 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 fibrin itself and there will be another video coming up where i'll be showing another evidence from another group of scientists as well showing something similar very wild information uh, uh, as well and different types of experiments, so stay tuned for that. I also wanted to let you know that we have another COVID Q&A coming up, and uh, so please check that out. Uh, one more piece of information is that thanks to all of you and all of your support of watching the videos, this is a big deal, so I have to mention this while I remember, is that I've been invited to a couple conferences, literally thanks to, to the YouTube videos, and uh, uh, where I get to discuss the science, the, the science that I get to study and research, it's a big deal because, because we need to understand this information on a deeper level. We need more scientists and more individuals involved in studying this information. Why? Because we need to know what are the predisposing factors that might be influencing who ends up having these unusual clots, how can we prevent it, and more, of course, most importantly, how do we treat it once this might be happening in an in any individual right so thank you so much for your support thank you for sharing the videos thank you for all of that because because of that there's these videos get enough cloud that i've been invited so please check it out the registration um, link to the conference it's free is going to be provided in a description so please register if you're interested in the topic of long COVID. this conference talk will be dedicated to both the topic of long COVID as well as chronic fatigue syndrome why because these two conditions long COVID and chronic fatigue syndrome have remarkably similar symptoms as they present very similar symptoms and um, speaking of which i will be making another video by the same group of authors that i just whose work i just discussed in today's video where they studied the formation of these clots in individuals with chronic fatigue syndrome one of the most common questions that i'm getting from these videos in the series is how does the vaccinal spike protein contribute to this or how does the vaccine contribute to this and some of those questions we'll be answering in that video as well so please stay tuned and lastly uh, also please check out the patreon account it's a new account uh, where we post videos based on science as well but more controversial if i can put it that way where uh, where i'm not worried because it's it, there's a paywall there and, and i i'm i'm feeling more comfortable simply discussing mm, discussing information uh, and sharing opinions as opposed to simply analyzing scientific information of other people all right that's all i have for you today thank you once again and i'll look forward to seeing you next time everyone bye